All right. Well, thank you all for being here in person. We're always excited for in person these days. And for those of you that are joining virtually, um, my name is Donna Woodruff and the firm I work with is Capital Insight Partners. So we are a wealth management firm up in North Scottsdale. I'm responsible for, um, I have a, a, a group of clients as well as I do education and I'm a, a kind of a relationship manager for 401k plans as well. So I do quite a bit of um, education with people around finance topics. I'm a certified financial planner, um, which means I also do financial planning for people. So I'm very passionate about educating people about things that I think if we can make decisions about them, the sooner the better um, so that you're making the decision. I think it's always best when we have, we can have a voice and a say in our future um, and not leave the decisions, whether it's estate planning or long-term care, things like that to our children or to other people, you know. So we're gonna to talk today about long-term care. I'm gonna take a step back because we're just gonna start very basic. I took the approach that we don't know what long-term care is. So if we don't know what long-term care is, what does that mean for us? We're gonna talk about who needs it, why they need it, and what options are out there um, for you when it comes time that you need help in that area. And there's a ton of facts and numbers, and I'm kind of a number geek, so I'm gonna probably bombard you with some numbers in the, in the beginning. They're not things that you need to retain, just more just to compel you to see that this is a need that we all need to address for ourselves. So if we start first, what is long-term care? Um, basically, it's a different, it means different things for every single person, but at some point in your life, hopefully not, but you may reach a point where you need some help and whether you need somebody to come into your home and help prepare meals, or if you need someone to help you get out of bed in the morning and move about your home. Um, and maybe there's some even more personal items that you might need help with as far as toileting or if you have incontinence. Um, so these are what is determined activities of daily living, bathing, dressing, using the toilet, transferring to and from a bed or a chair, caring for incontinence and eating. So if you were to need to justify long-term care expense, if you were to have a policy or something, you would need to not be able to perform two of these activities of daily living. And then you are able, you are qualified to file for a claim for long-term care. And there are many ways you can do that but just know that this is what we're talking about when we're talking about long-term care is needing help in any one or more of these items. And then who needs care? Um, someone turning 65 today has almost a 70% chance of needing some type of long-term care services. Um, so it, it's, we all need it at some point is probably the reality. Um, and really the double trouble comes for women because women um, need care longer. So on average, 3.7 years is how long a woman would need this assistance. For men, it's 2.2 years. But if we think back to um, my grandparents' days, um, it was women who provided the care. We were the ones, we, it was the daughters, the, the you know, daughter-in-laws. My mom did it for my grandmother. Well, now fast forward to the 2020s, I'm working. You know, I'm working, I'm bringing in an income that's really integral to my family. So if my parents who are 75 have a long-term care event, number one, there's the fact that I'm working. Number two, there's the geographic issue. A lot more people aren't staying where they were born. You know, the my mom lives in the town that she grew up in and that's where my grandparents were. I'm in Arizona, my mom's in Boston. So the logistics of me, you know, it's not fair to expect her to uproot her life and move out here so I can take care of her. At the same time, how can I continue to work and support my family and take care of her as well? So it's really um, a different world out there. And I would say, and we'll see later on the slides, majority of people do expect to get care from their loved ones. That's, that's how a majority of people solve for this. Um, so really just thinking through that um, and thinking through what your plans are when the time comes. Um, Women are likely to be single as they age as well is another challenge. So, because number one, if you are 65 or older today, your average life expectancy from this point on is about 86.6 years for a woman. For a man, it's gonna be about 82 years. So we live longer and we're the ones providing most of the care. 
And you know, honestly, there's a lot more people who are being are experiencing divorce later in life. So then you have you're on your own. You're single where you expected maybe there was going to be a partner there to help support you. Um, so there's just different challenges that we need to think through. Um, I don't bring all these things up to be depressing or it's just a reality. And I think we need to be talking about it as a society and have solutions and talk about it with your loved ones and just have it clear what your expectations are and what kind of help you would need when this time comes. Um, as a financial planner, one of the things that I always wanna make sure people have is some sort of disability insurance. And it says the people who are going on long-term care, it's becoming younger. So here we see between the ages of 40 and 50, on average, 8% of the people have a disability that could require long-term care services. You know, so people are much more likely to file a claim against a long-term care or disability policy than they are a term life insurance. Um, it's, it's quite frequent that people experience issues that disable them in some way or prevent them from caring for themselves then actually d die. So um, it's, important, it's an important thing that we all need to be addressing. Um, and even for people who have children who are younger in their 30s and 40s, they need to be thinking through what happened, you know, what happens if I'm not able to go to work every day, I need to have something that replaces my paycheck. So that's a little ditty on disability, but long term care in the same vein, 69% of people age 90 or more have a disability. That means that they're going to need long term care services because they can't Mentally, they might be able to do everything, but physically, they're not able to do what they need to do to live in their home independently. If you um, are experiencing chronic conditions such as diabetes, high blood pressure, that's going to make your long-term care needs probably a little, bring a little more to the forefront. Um, and your family health history. I have a client who, um, the I have all three generations of the family. So I have the parents, I have their children, and then I have their young children who are in college now. The parents have set up savings accounts for them and investing accounts. But so the grandfather has Alzheimer's and he has been in a care facility for a number of years. There are certain things that we experience, dementia, Alzheimer's, that um, we can live a long time with those, but we do need some help. Um, and, the wife took care of him as long as she could at home. And then it just became, it was a, a lot on her. Um, and honestly, if you look at statistics, unfortunately, what we see is that sometimes the person, the caregiver can be the one that can pass away before the person with Alzheimer's just because of the amount of energy that goes into and the stress and physically demanding it can be for that person. So he's in a facility in downtown Phoenix. He's very happy. He's happier. He's more secure where he's at. He doesn't, um, he was having some anger issues and things like that. All that has gone away. So he's happy. They can, unfortunately, weren't able to see him through the pandemic um, because to even go up to the window would have been too confusing for him. But now they were able to FaceTime and stay in touch with him. And now they can see him in person again. But um, just to be, thinking through your family history, what are some things that you possibly could have to deal with and solution, you know, creating solutions around that for you. So this is a little more factual and you have copies of this in the handout as well. If it's a little, it's not too small up there. It's a little small in here, but thinking through who needs care again, you know, for any type of service, the average number of years people use any type of service is three years. And that applies to 69% of people. The people that are using the at-home care, unpaid care only, that's a family member, obviously, then paid care less than a year, any care at home, two years. So you can see a lot of people are still dealing with long-term care in, at home. And um, I think the challenge is gonna be, and I think you've seen the advertising that's been on the, new, on the TV stations, there's a shortage of people providing this care. Um, so to the degree that, unfortunately we live Unfortunately, fortunately, we live in a country where it really cash is king. So those people that have money to pay for this care are going to be able to, um, you know, probably jump to the front of the line for services over people that have to rely on Medicaid and things like that. So just thinking solution, creating a solution for yourself around that. And then in facilities, obviously, the, the time that people spend in facilities is shorter on average. Um, again, I know my client has been in a facility for over five years. So it just depends um, what your situation is. And about 35, anywhere from 13 to 35% are using that type of care. 
Okay, and then thinking through for you personally, who's gonna provide your care? You know, an unpaid caregiver who may be a family member or friend, that, that's, solutioning, that's the solution for 80% of people who have care at home. Um, other people, it's gonna be a nurse, a home health aide, home care aide, therapist who comes to the home. There are adult daycare services. And I was at a meeting a couple of weeks ago and someone was sharing about adult daycare services that Honor Health provides um, to people down around South Mountain. And they have a waiting list like a mile long for people to get into that program. So they're you know, vetting out what the good resources are near you and seeing if you need to, you know, what is that time frame? You know, what, how long should I be on a waiting list? How do I access those services if I need to? And then obviously we all know there's a variety of long-term care facilities. That could be a traditional nursing home, I have a client who lives out in Sun City. She sold her home, moved into Grandview Terrace and it has levels of care. So she's there for the rest of her life, but she's still, she's in her nineties. She's living independently in her apartment. She's kind of the Julie McCoy of the whole thing. She's social director. She's organizing dinners. She brings flowers to people who are in assisted living. You know, if it's Easter lilies at Easter time. So um, there are a variety of venues that you can look at um, when the, when you're looking for that. So into the, the stats on long-term care, sometimes they can be more current. Sometimes there's a little delay in kind of collect, pulling all that information together. So this one's in 2015, 43 and a half million people in the US had been caregivers in the last 12 months. And that was one of our poll questions that I, I think we didn't do in the beginning, but are the people in the room here, how many of you have been a caregiver for someone, a loved one or a family member or friend? So I guess we should have asked this question to everybody before we started, but on a scale of like one to 10, how many people feel like they have a lot of knowledge about long-term care right? you know, coming into this meeting? The middle amount, like five, and then zero, like very little coming in here. Okay. All right. And we can see the answers of the poll. And then does anyone have any type of long-term care policy that they have in place to meet this need for them? No. Okay. All right, great. Thank you for answering those questions. That helps me kind of know what to focus on. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. So have you been, a, been the virtual people? Have you been a caregiver for a loved one or has a loved one been in a care facility? And I asked that question here and there were a couple people that raised, about three people raised hands on that. And as we said in the beginning, two thirds of caregivers are women and 14% of caregivers are age 65 or older. So, and I have a client who had, she's probably in her late sixties and she's a caregiver for a number of like 90 plus people out in Sun City. And then she actually fell and injured herself and wasn't able to do it for a period of time. But um, then she went through rehab and is back getting around and she's out helping her ladies doing grocery shopping and getting them to the stores. So, but yeah, it's, you know, there are, just thinking through that and who the, who the people are gonna be that are gonna give you care and having options there. Oh, hold on. Okay. So those are a lot of facts about long-term care. Now we're gonna turn to kind of the factors, the things, the questions that you need to ask yourself. So where would you want to live if you needed care? Some people, many people are gonna say home. They don't wanna be somewhere else. Who would you want to provide your care? That might be a loved one, or it could just be a trusted home health aide or someone you know who's cared for someone else. And how are you gonna pay for that care when you need it? Okay, this, it's showing better up there than it is here. So this is from Gemworth and there's, I put footnotes at the bottom of all the slides so you can see where I got this information from. And there's definitely a lot more resources available at these websites. Um, but for Gemworth, um, this is for Phoenix, Arizona, the average um, cost per month for these services. So homemaker services, that's someone coming in about 12 hours a day to provide assistance this is around the 5,000 range, adult day healthcare. That looks a little low to me, but that's the number they pulled, but so roughly a thousand a month. And I tried to Google like how many hours that actually is of adult healthcare and it, it did not provide additional details there. Assisted living, a private one bedroom is 3,700 a month. And then when you get to 
full nursing care, 24 hour nursing care, then we're looking at 9,247 for a semi-private room and 10,646 for a private room. So these costs are astronomical. And what I know from what I do as a financial planner is that healthcare costs inflate a lot more than our cost of goods. Like our, normally we would say your cost of a loaf of bread is going to go up about 2% a year. Cost of healthcare goes up about 5% a year when we're doing a financial plan for people. So 5% every year. So they're going to double in about 20 years, the, whatever these costs are in today's dollars now. Um, what I can tell you is that the national average um, for these numbers is about 105,000 annually for a private room. And 200, that's $290 a day. And the average stay in one of these facilities is about 2.8 years. So you're looking at about 300,000 in today's dollars and then that doubling in 20 years. So inflation is the thing that really makes or breaks a lot of our planning for retirement because unfortunately our income doesn't keep up with the and we've seen that even in the past year a lot more than with the supply chain issues that we've had across the country with the pandemic the inflation is over three percent right now whereas we had had next to no inflation so for people who are on a fixed income you know we're waiting to see what the social security increase is going to be but that can be very challenging. And that's something that we, we need to be aware of as we're planning for the future. 7% um, of the long-term care delivered in the US is paid for by private insurance. Majority of people are relying on Medicaid, um, their own funds to fund this. Not many people are going out and getting long-term care policies. And I'm gonna get into the kind of the different types of insurance that is available to you. And we'll kind of learn why some of those insurances are, um, why people have avoided them in some cases um, and why, and how they've changed the industry to make it more enticing, I think, for people to, to look at them as a, as a option. But the things you need to think about when we look at these costs is, I know how much, you know, depending on how much you have in your investments and in your savings, in your income from your resources in retirement, how much, you know, how much do you need to offset? People don't necessarily need to come up with a $10,000 a month for X number of years. They can say, well, I've got resources to maybe fund half of that, but, or I don't want to use all of the resources I have saved. I want to leave a legacy for my family, or I have a spouse that is going to, you know, that's gonna need resources when I'm gone. So figure out how much you're looking, what kind of benefit you're looking to get a month and then what you consider an affordable premium to be. So those are some questions to keep in the back of your mind as we move forward here. So what the industry has come up with is a variety of options. So there is the standalone and we'll get into more details on all of these. There's a life insurance type product. And again, I'm not pushing product at all today. I'm not at all. I want you to understand what's out there and the pros and cons of each different type. Um, annuity is, a, is the third option, which wasn't used very frequently, but is becoming more, um, more prevalent in the industry now. So if we start with standalone, we can think about a standalone life insurance, um, long-term care policy, like an auto policy. You use it or lose it. We pay our premiums every month to the auto insurer. And if we never get an accident, well, then we never get anything out of that policy. Um, and that's where we have to approach it the way I said before. You just determine how much coverage you want, what an affordable premium is, and really, um, you know, and that should drive kind of when you go out to market, what you look at as far as solutions. With a standalone policy, you pay as you go by paying those premiums. Premiums can increase. And that's probably what you've heard. A lot of people haven't done these standalone policies. And honestly, personally, I'm not a fan of these. I don't recommend these to my clients. People have them because they bought them a long time ago. So now it doesn't make sense for you to abandon a policy that you've put thousands of dollars into, tens of thousands of dollars. But what happens is the insurer can file paperwork with the state of Arizona and say that they wanna increase premiums. If they increase premiums, they have to get it approved and it has to apply to everybody at, a, you know, at the different break points. They usually bracket them by five years. So um, it's, it is a bit of a process, but with COVID, we've seen a lot of insurers going 
to increase premiums. And I've seen some, I've heard and seen some increases in premiums that were very significant, almost triple in some of these cases. Um, but what it does cover is it covers long-term care, all long-term care venues. So we wanna make sure that if we are gonna to go to the trouble of getting policy, that we're not restricted on what the insurer is gonna pay for. We wanna know that whatever option I choose to meet my long-term care need, if that's a home health aid coming in the house, or if it's going to assisted living, or if it's going to full-on nursing care, that my policy is gonna apply regardless. Um, because you're paying a premium every month, they kind of have you, you know, you're, they kind of have you on the hook for that. So then it's more customizable. There are bells and whistles that you can add. And really the things that you're gonna change are really the elimination period. The elimination period winds up being like your deductible. If you're in a car accident, you have to pay the first thousand dollars. With long-term care insurance, you have to pay for the first six months of care or three months of care, whatever your 90 day, 180, obviously the longer the elimination period, the cheaper your premium. So that's how they, same way, the higher your deductible, the more you're willing to pay out of pocket on an auto insurance, the lower your premium as well, because you're taking on more of the risk than the insurer, you know, some of the risk off the insurer's plate in those scenarios. Um, there is underwriting involved with long-term care policies. So they're gonna do a full physical um, paramed exam. There are cognitive screens that they put you through as well. One of my clients went through a policy a, about a year ago and she called me afterwards. She's like, Donnie, you didn't tell you. <laughs> like they'll give you numbers and then you, they'll ask you later on to remember what those numbers, it was pretty. And she, you know, she's still working. She's in her sixties and she's like, it was a little challenging. <laughs> so there's a cognitive screen as well as a physical kind of paramed exam that they're going to put you through. Um, the benefits are tax-free because you're paying the premiums. When the benefits are paid to you, if it's $2,000 a month, $3,000 a month, there's no taxes due on that because you've already paid those premiums with after-tax dollars that were in your checking account. You can get a standalone policy as early as 18 to age 79. Um, the challenge is, uh, you know, the younger you get it, you get it in your 40s, you're paying that premium all the time, you know, for 40 years. You're basically... You could argue that if you took the money you were going to pay in a premium at that early an age and put it in some inve moderate investment account, you might wind up with the same amount of benefit and you wouldn't have to use it for long-term care like this. And obviously, the later in life you get it, with this underwriting, they can your premiums could be higher if they see certain risks in your family. Um, I would recommend if anybody goes to talk to an insurance person about long-term care, that they really make sure that person knows long-term care. Because if a person who knows the industry knows that certain providers have a predisposition towards certain things, like if they know you have diabetes in your family, A insurer might be okay with that. They might have a better attitude about that than B insurer. And people who specialize in insurance and in this industry know kind of the details about that and can really save you some trouble because it's a there's a lot of work that goes into applying for insurance and going through those exams and the cognitive screens. And if they're, if whatever you have in your family history might be a knock against you, you don't want to go through all that trouble and then have it come back and be like, well, I can't afford that. That would be really frustrating. So just make sure you go to someone and, um, who really knows what they're doing. So that's one option. The pay as you go, like an auto premium, standalone insurance. The other option is, I have a life insurance policy. Me, sorry, I touched the microphone. I have a life insurance policy and I wanna add on a long-term care rider. So what that means is my life insurance policy says, I pay this much a year. And if I die anytime in the next 20, 30 years, depends on the term, my heirs are gonna get 500,000, a million dollars. Maybe it's 250,000. By having a long-term care rider, there's two ways that can work for you. It gives you access to the death benefit, that 250,000. If you have a long-term care event, now it lets you start withdrawing off that 250,000 to pay for your long-term care. And if there are funds left when you pass, the remaining death benefit would go out to your heirs. The other option is it works in tandem with that because honestly, 
when that 250,000 or 500,000 is gone, there's no more money. If you're still alive, there's no more money coming out to pay for your care. You can do a rider, which gives you basically a lifetime benefit. It'll, it'll extend those funds past the actual dollar amount. So it, it promises you that it's going to pay you X amount a month for this period of time, regardless if your $250,000 death benefits exhausted or not. So that's um, it basically, you know, that's one way to do it. I don't know what I've found working in this industry for over 20 years is that sometimes when we try to make things do more than one thing, like we're like, oh, this is great. We can bolt all this on together. It, you kind of give up on the quality. You, you give up, you know, you're giving up some flexibility, some customization. Um, it just, sometimes it can work for people, but sometimes I think it, you do give up a little bit of the flexibility that you have with just a standalone policy. Um, but live, die, or quit, there is a benefit. So there's going to be money there for you to pay for long-term care. If you pass away, your family's going to get the death benefit. Um, and if you quit the policy, because a lot of these are done off of a cash value life insurance, there's some cash there. So if you're paying the premium for your life insurance and you decide, I'm going to do something different or I don't want this now, I think I can self-fund my long-term care they're gonna give you back whatever the cash value is. So you'll get something out of the policy one way or another versus just a straight term policy that doesn't have cash value. It just tells you if you pay your premium, you have a death benefit. And again, coverage is covered in all venues on policy like this. It is less customizable. And because you have, you're paying your premiums and you're creating this pool of funds, that cash value, there's less risk to the insurance company. So they're a little more lenient on the underwriting. It may not be as strict. So there might be a little more flexibility there. So that's where is a, when I look at my client, I think, okay, you know, if they have some health issues or, you know, how easy is it going to be for this person to get through um, underwriting? Do they have any health care issue, health issues currently? Is there anything in their family history that could possibly be a knock against them? So typically I go through a questionnaire with people and then I bring that to my insurance provider and I we kind of talk through it and figure out what the best option is for people. Um, death benefits paid from death benefit or there's an extension rider. And again, that's available from ages 20 to 80. So, you know, obviously the later in life that you initiate any of these things, the higher the, you have a shorter time frame from when you're going to need it. So going out to market at age 70 for these things, you may find that the premiums are pretty spendy and, and not, may not be affordable for you. So the last option, and I guess I'm going faster than I thought, sorry, Bruce. <laughs> the last option to think about is an annuity. And that's where, and I'm not a big fan of annuities. I don't sell, I'm typically not a, a big insurance. I only provide insurance to clients if they ask for it, if I really think it, they need it. Um, so I have a number of women clients, single women clients. So we've had this conversation just about what, what your care going to be. And I have sold a couple of annuity policies for people or actually Susan in my office, who's the insurance person has, has sold them, but we've, I've consulted from a planning perspective. The benefit of the annuity products is you can put a large sum in today. So let's just say, um, so you could put a large, say we put $100,000 in an annuity today. We're 65 years old and we put 100,000 in. Um, then most people would go on long-term care at about mid 80s, so 85. So putting 100,000 in today gives that money 20 years to grow. And what I know is that from the quotes I've pulled for clients, that 100,000 can become 300, 350,000. The insurance company basically promises you that if you go on claim, we're going to pay you 5,000 a month. And it can either be for six years or it can be for your, the rest of your life. They're structured differently. But the, the other nice part about these policies is if you put the money in, if you die never needing care, all of that comes out as a death benefit to your heirs. So you're not use it or lose it, you know, you're not paying something that you may never receive a benefit for. So they can be pretty compelling to some people. You're still gonna go through the underwriting, although it is more lenient because they've got a big chunk of your money. 
you can pay that in a lump sum. You can pay it over for people who are in their 50s who look at this, they could look at paying a few thousand a year over 10 years. And then the insurance company says, okay, you're gonna pay this much over this period of time. Then we're gonna give you this benefit. And usually the benefit is structured stru such that you have a benefit day one that you start the policy. So if you're 51 and you have some, something that happens and you need to go on claim at age 51 or 52, they're gonna pay you maybe 3,500 a month for X amount of years or the rest of your life. If you go on claim in 20 years and the money's had all that time to grow, then your benefit's gonna be 5,000, 5,300, something higher because the money's had a chance to work in the market. So it is pretty compelling. And then they, another way they structure these, the thing you have to be aware of on any of these long-term care policies, there are some that you have to provide receipts for. So they're, gonna, they're reimbursable. And then there are some that are indemnity plans. Reimbursable means I'm gonna to need to provide receipts in order, if I'm eligible to receive $5,000 a month for my policy, I need to submit receipts that are legitimate for that. Indemnity says I can't perform two of the ADLs we talked about in the beginning. I'm gonna start paying you 5,000 a month. You don't have to send me any receipts. So there are, you know, and there, the premiums can be pretty consistent too. I mean, you just have to shop the market, but, um, it's definitely something to consider as well. Uh, usually the ones that do, you don't have to provide receipts for have more of a definite time frame. So they may be structured such that you have a benefit for six years. Now we know from the beginning, average claims are about three years. So you're okay there. The ones that you provide receipts for, those might have a lifetime benefit, but they're also, you've got to justify it with actual receipts. Now, you know, you can have your, your family caregiver provide your receipt as well. I mean, there are ways to get reimbursed a family caregiver. Even the state will, will reimburse family care caregivers for disabled people if you file the appropriate paperwork. Um, and these annuity products are available from age 40 to 85. And again, if you die never needing care, all that money comes out to you. So those can be pretty compelling for people as well. There is, and I'm not sure if anybody's talked to them already, but there's Arizona Long-Term Care Services, which is through senior planning. Because some people might say that they're gonna use Medicaid to fund their long-term care. Or they think that Medicare has a long-term care benefit. But I can tell you, and you probably, someone's shaking their head here. <laughs> Medicare is gonna hunt, they're re rehabilitative. So if they think that you're gonna go to a facility be able to be rehabilitated and then come out and live independently. They're gonna cover 100% of the first 20 days in a skilled nursing facility. And then they may cover a portion of the next 80 days, but your deductible on those 80 days is gonna be 185.50 as of last year. And then when we think about Medicaid, then we have to deal with the spend down provision. So in, it varies state to state. In Arizona, spend down basically means that the government will start paying when you have exhausted all of your resources. And really the exhausted all your resources dollar amount for Arizona is $2,000. So, and if you have social security coming in every month, that's in excess of 2000, they're gonna expect you to spend to, you know, anything above $2,000 towards your care and then, um, then they'll pay the difference. I know my grandmother was in a nursing home, Blueberry Hill, <laughs> and it was right down the street from um, where my mom was a teacher's aide at the school. So every day my mom would go by and pick up her laundry. There were things we just did for her, even though she was in there for 24 hour care. We, we did her, you know, bought her incidentals, anything she needed. Um, and we took her laundry home, brought her her tissues. There's always some reason we had to stop by and visit her, which was nice. And honestly, my aunt was there, my neighbors went there. Like it was, it was like old home week because we knew all our friends' grandparents went there. My sister-in-law actually was an, isn't still a nurse there. Um, but so she was at, at this facility and she owned, my grandfather had passed away of lung cancer. And so she owned the home, but we had to sell the home put all that in an account and use all of those dollars to pay for her care. And then when those dollars were exhausted, then the state paid, um, kicked in and started paying for her care. And my husband's um, grandmother died at 107. My grandmother died at 85, but his 
107 she had used every cent she had um, and she did the same thing she used all of her resources but um, a lot of people I mean that's that's a hard thing to do you know to sell your family home and you you know divide everything up and um, if there's another way I think people would rather have more control than that and not feel like they were just on this spend down um, to, to nothing nobody wants to be in that position of course you have she was fortunate to have family who were there to step in and provide anything she needed. Some people unfortunately aren't in that position. So just wanna make sure that you have um, conversations around this, that you make decisions for yourself. I think about long-term care and kind of estate planning, the wills and trusts part of it, all in the same vein. Like I always want someone, one of my clients to make the decision for themselves and then I can help execute it when the time comes and if they lose their cognitive ability and they can't do it for themselves, I at least have, I know from their mouth what, the, what their wishes were and I can help work with the family to get that executed. Uh, I think we need to think the same way about this. These are the hard conversations. You know, my father waited till he was 73 years old to draft a trust in a will I basically got to the point, he's in Boston. So I was like, I'm not coming home to visit you again until you take care of this. Because <laughs> I'm like, I know what your wishes are. I have a brother who's handicapped and there's, they want to set aside funds for him. And at the, everyone's happy and everyone you know wants to support you. But then when you're not there anymore as the family patriarch or matriarch, it's, things can get off the rails pretty quickly if they aren't in writing and if it's not expressed to people. So I really encourage you all to think about these different options. I'm available to talk offline as well and just, you know, have a solution for yourself that you feel great about, um, whatever that is. And if you need help bring, you know, kind of brainstorming a solution, then I'm happy to help with that as well. But I didn't want to overwhelm you with information because there is a ton of information around this. I did put the links to the places where I found this information. Nicole Gurley is a certified financial planner here in North Scottsdale. All she does is long-term care. So she is a very trusted advisor to me. Um, so I, I recommend, she has a great website with a lot of articles and resources and she's always refreshing the content as well. So that's another person that you could reach out to here locally you know, for, for information too. Um, but that's all I have for you today.